First of all, I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Um, a lot of kind words have been said about me, but I want to clarify a few things. I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I never have been. I'm not now, nor will I ever be. I'm too smart for that. <laughs> <laughs> because I know how much I don't know. And I'm learning every day that I live, the world keeps opening up larger and larger. And I started this um, <laughs> escapade back in 1959. I started talking to audiences in 1962 about secret societies, the New World Order, occultism, and it was in 1966 that Anthony J. Hilder produced his first record set with Myron Fagan on Illuminati. And it was Anthony J. Hilder and Myron Fagan who introduced into American society the idea of secret societies and Illuminati. So when you hear the concept being discussed by anyone of secret societies, and especially that word Illuminati, remember it was Anthony J. Hilder who introduced it, and the man who talked about it, Anthony, actually produced the records, and it was Myron Fagan, a very important man that you need to know about, who's no longer with us. Myron Fagan, Myron Fagan was the man who introduced the idea of Illuminati. As I said, I was talking about these subjects back in 1962, before most of the people who now talk about it were even still in school. So consequently, I've... Um, I've looked at many different areas of conspiracy since that time, and I'm appalled at uh, what I see happening in this country today. We are told that America is the land of laws, a nation built on laws. In point of fact, nothing could be further from the truth. America is run by people who are lawless. We have no law in America. And understand that. The law is whatever the powers that be in power happen to say it is today. Whatever they say it is, that's what the law is today. And it may change tomorrow. So what you need to understand is this is not a nation of laws. It's a nation of lawlessness. And somewhere along the line we're going to be dealt with by that universal God force because of what we have allowed to happen in our country. Now in relation to the subject today which is the occult world of commerce, let me give you a couple of examples of why I think where you need to start thinking. If you uh, are going to send a box through the mail and you need to wrap it with some rope, you go out in the garage and you find some some rope and tie up the box and that should be sufficient to do the mailing. But if you're going to take that rope out to the edge of a 10-story building and hang on it, you better trust and you better examine the integrity of that rope now because your life hangs in the balance on it. Another example is if you owned a two-story building and you were going to put a lot of weight on the second floor. If you, were, if you were smart, you would go downstairs first with the structural engineer, get on a ladder, and go up through the ceiling tiles and examine the floor that you're going to put that weight on to see if the floor is going to hold that kind of weight. So what you're doing is you are standing under the foundation you're going to build on. You're standing under to get understanding, because that's where the word understand comes from, to stand under the foundation that you're building on. <clears throat> understanding words is what you really need to start doing. You need to start doing your homework and understanding words. If you put an S in front of words, it becomes swords. And that's what words are. They are cutting. They can cause you great trouble. Humans are 
word control creatures. So we need to establish what words mean. Again, when we talk about law, there's a Roman maximum in law that says, for he that would be deceived, let him. Simply meaning, if you are so ignorant as to be deceived, then that's your business. That's your problem. So you need to do your homework and find out what the words mean, especially in relation to law and government. Because there is a whole a world of occultism that is operating today throughout the world in which you use certain words, and when those words are used in a court, they don't mean the same thing at all. Understanding law and the words of law, there are two things that this planet has. Water and earth, water and land. Consequently, there are two kinds of law, the law of the land and the law of water. You've heard the term law of the land, but in point of fact, that's precisely what this word means, law of the land, because it is the people who live on land. And that is opposed to something else called the law of the high seas or the law of water. You need to understand the difference. The law of the land is the law of the culture that lives on the land. And so consequently, the law of the land is different in every country. You can do things in America you can't do in Russia. You can do things in Africa you can't do in England. So the law of the land is the law of the culture that lives on that particular land. However, there is a higher law that dominates the entire world. It's called the law of the water or the law of the high seas. The law of water is referred to as the law of money. It doesn't matter what color you are, where you're from, or where you live. Money is money. And any time you're doing banking or using money, you are now under the law of water, maritime admiralty. If you go back in history, in ancient history, where all of this began, back in the land of Cana, and I've heard, you probably have heard in the Bible, the land of Cana, the Canaanites were Phoenician, Phoenician bloodline. And in the ancient Phoenician language, Cana meant merchant banker. The very word merchant comes from mer, M-E-R, for the sea, for water. As a mermaid, we have merchant. Merchant bankers. Let me give an example of the difference between the law of water and the law of the land. The law of water, as I said, is a law of banking, money, as opposed to the law of the custom of the people or the law of the land. Um, the Statue of Liberty must be put in water. It could not be put on American land as such. It had to be put in the harbor because it's not the Statue of Freedom. It's a Statue of Liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he pulls into port on a ship. He gets liberty. He's not free. So America is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not free or brave, period. We're not free. This is not a free country. Now let me give you an example of how this law of the water works. Why is it that you have to go to court? People are always concerned about going to court. You go to court because you play basketball and tennis on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. Why? Because that's what it is. It's a racket. And make no mistake, they do not pick words by chance. These words are very serious. They do not use words in terms... Um, with no avail. These words are very important. When you go into a court, what's the idea of going to court? It's a game, like basketball. The whole idea in a court is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. Uh, one team gets up and they throw the ball over to that team of lawyers. That team gets up and throws the ball back into their court. 
and consequently it's a ball game. And the judge is wearing a black robe, so he is the referee. The judge is the referee. He doesn't care which side wins or loses because he's going to get paid anyway. So he couldn't care less. He's merely there as a referee, and that's why he wears a black robe. And that's another interesting subject we can get into later. But the judge is a, is a referee between two teams. The judge, that we are told, rules from the bench. The word bench in Latin is a bank. Therefore, the judge rules for the bank. Where do you find banks? You find banks on both sides of a river. They're called river banks. And what does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the current sea. <laughs> the juice. Consequently, your money is current. See, because it's the flow, the cash flow. And I'll give you an example of how this works. When a ship pulls into a harbor, all ships are referred to as female. Airships, rocket ships, sailing ships are always female. Why? There's a very good reason. Maritime Admiralty Banking Law says all ships are female because uh, they're carrying items, they're carrying items for money, and so consequently they are under maritime admiralty law. Admiralty is where we get the word admiral, admiral of the navy. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how this works. When a ship pulls into a harbor, it parks at the dock, and it ties off at the dock. The captain has to provide for the um, port authorities a certificate of manifest because yesterday the ship was not here but this morning the ship pulled in so it has manifested so consequently all the products the 800 million dollars worth of TVs or Toyotas have manifested so each one of those items coming off of that ship has come off of water and each end they has come in a ship and consequently on a ship all ships have a captain the word captain comes from a Latin word, capital, money. So the captain represents the money that's on board the ship. And as I said, the captain has to present to the port authorities a certificate of manifest for each and every item. How much does it weigh? What color is it? How many doors does it have? Etc. And consequently, the captain presents a certificate of manifest the ship is sitting in its berth. Wherever a ship sits when it docks is called its berth. She sits in her berth, berthing a ship. Consequently, all the items, as I said, coming off that ship represent money. They came in on water. They are maritime admiralty product. And this is true all over the world. Now, when you were born your mother's water broke and when your mother's water broke you came out and this is why you have to have a birth certificate because you are a maritime admiralty product under international law you are considered your body is considered a maritime admiralty product your mother delivered you this is why if you go to Sears and buy a refrigerator they will ship it to you they will deliver it. And that's why you were in your delivery room. Your mother was delivering a product. Maritime Admiralty. You came down your mother's birth canal. <laughs> and once you, uh, and as you're taking one of the, uh, the televisions or the cars off the ship and it falls down and breaks, uh, that's all right. Sometimes they're stillborn, so consequently you've lost money on that one. Therefore, you have to have a death certificate. And it's always signed by the doc. The doc has to sign your birth certificate and your death certificate. All of these words and terms are maritime admiralty banking words. And therefore, if you understand lawyers, and judges and courts and government 
are all under international maritime admiralty law. All religions, all churches in the world operate under maritime law. This is why all churches are divided into denominations like 20s and 50s and 100s. Serious. This is why they're called denominations, because all churches are nothing more than the product of maritime admiralty banking. It's an extraordinary story of occult uh, treason, high treason and crimes against the state. Make no mistake about it. There has never been a country on the face of the earth as far back into history as you can go. There has never existed a country in which the people rose up and demanded their right to be free. Never. The concept of human, spiritual, intellectual, and physical freedom is a totally uh, concept that has never, ever existed on the earth. The only time that has ever come into existence was the founding of this country where it was understood that we were sovereigns and we owned our bodies and consequently since 1868 we're now on the international maritime admiralty law. Think about this, when cowboys and in Indian movies, when the cowboys would ride into town, they get off the horse, they were wearing guns. How come they could walk into a bar carrying guns? And if two guys got in an argument, they could go out on the street and draw on each other in front of the sheriff's office, and the sheriff would do nothing. How come? How come that men could go out in the street and shoot each other in front of everyone and have nothing be done about it? The reason why is because before 1868, all Americans were considered sovereigns. And that's one of the nice things about being a sovereign, is you have the right to be yourself. And consequently... You need to understand that in one last point I'm going to make before I introduce your speaker, that in 1868 there was a corporation founded. In, uh, anyone can incorporate a company. Well, in 1868 there was a company incorporated. And in that particular company, the founders of that company called it, they referred to it as the United States Corporation. And they stipulated that anybody who would be a member of that corporation or work for that corporation would be called not an employee but a citizen. So today, if you are asked, are you a citizen of the United States, what you think you're being asked is, are you lawfully in this country to do business? That's not lawfully what's being asked. They didn't ask you if you were in America lawfully. They ask you a specific question. Are you of your own volition, out of your own mouth, testifying that you are a citizen of the United States? Because in that way, citizen of the United States means you are an employee of a foreign corporation operating on international maritime law. So today, the president of the United States is the president of a privately owned company. The company is called United States. And the word president is always a word that is used in corporate law. Banks have presidents. All companies have presidents. So there's a corporation called United States, privately owned, and it has a president. President Bush is not the president of America. President Bush is the president of a privately owned company. Privately owned, out of England. And you need to understand words and terms. Because I believe that there is a divine presence in the universe that men call God. And one day that divine presence is going to move on the earth and we're going to see freedom come back to this world. And when it does, you're going to need to understand words and terms and how they have been used to trick you. And that's the, the speech that today I'm introducing, Jason Whitney, to give you some ideas about how these words have been used to enslave you. And with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, Jason Whitney. Hello, everyone. I'm going to just uh, restart the computer here. Um, there's a lot to cover, and I'm uh, going to go pretty quick. And some of the stuff that we're going to go over is in essence a reiteration of some of the uh, concepts that Jordan presented to you. 
So, um, but we're going to give them with visual examples so they hopefully give you a better mental anchor. Um, so when you see this stuff come up, if you should ever, you know, uh, get involved in a situation where you unfortunately have to go to court, you understand the name of the tune. And uh, it, you'll find out at the end of all of this today, it's just business. Um, I, I was first uh, introduced to Jordan Maxwell approximately three and a half years ago. Uh, I was up late at night, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning when my girlfriend had uh, said, hey, you got to listen to this guy. And um, I was doing homework. I was originally a computer science major uh, studying network engineering. And I set my books aside, and I walked over to the uh, table, and I flipped on uh, the channel so I could hear the radio in the room I was in. And I hear this guy talking. And the information was so powerful uh, that was being presented, I was absolutely uh, blown away. I went and grabbed a notebook, and I started taking notes because, you know, I, I was... I've been into the occult since I was about 18, and I've studied uh, mostly uh, stuff on, you know, basic secret societies and and uh, pyramidology and the concepts of some UFO ET stuff. But what Jordan presented on that radio show put the entire world system, whether it be religion, banking, or politics, or UFOs and aliens, and the concept of, you know, the alien ant farm, which is Earth, all into a construct that that I could basically see with open eyes, kind of like the Matrix uh, revelation. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for Jordan, in any capacity, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. And uh, certainly, uh, <laughs> you know, my, my, myself and a collective group of people that have uh, become researchers, and I'm, I, I like to consider myself, in essence, you know, a, still a neophyte because I'm not an expert on anything like Jordan. However, so many researchers that we have come into contact with have been facilitated into this particular paradigm as a result of Jordan's research. And um, like I said, in my, my particular opinion, Jordan is truly the godfather of occultism. So... We'll just wait for this uh, machine to boot up here so I can get to the, uh, the good stuff. My uh, presentation in part is predicated upon uh, the images. But anyways, the, the world of admiralty that we're going to um, talk about today is it's a concept and it's a philosophy. Um, the, what the system, uh, Jordan explained that there's two kinds of law in the world. There's civil law and there's the law of water and money. Well, we, we have our common law system where collective groups of people come together and they agree to, to follow particular behavioral patterns. However, the banking system, or the, the banksters or gangsters or whatever you want to call them, have collectively, through thousands of years, have set up a situation where they can manipulate people to superimpose a... Um, a legal system that is not based entirely on law, it's based on commerce. And so this, this artificial let's pretend construct has basically been superimposed over our uh, law of our land. And as we'll get into it, um, I'll explain that, or I'll, I'll try to demonstrate further that um, we are not operating in a common law system anymore, although the common law is still here and we need to understand how to access it, and how to use it to our advantage. But most people, unfortunately, are so ignorant of what the law is or what the codes are or the, what the statutes actually say and how they particularly apply to them. They just are used to functioning in a consensus reality that, oh, well, you know, at 18 or 16, everyone gets a driver's license. And, you know, when I work, everyone uh, fills out a 1040 IRS tax form or because he said or because your parents said or because your parents were particularly indoctrinated in a, in a system where everyone is function, functioning perpetually in this let's pretend game. So uh, we're going to go over a couple things here uh, really fast. Um, this presentation, like I um, said earlier, uh, it's dedicated entirely to Jordan Maxwell because this is his work just reiterated in a new light. Uh, with my own particular spice um, overlay. So again, thanks again, Jordan. Um, so interestingly enough, 
This ship, or the ships of the high seas in commerce, if you get back to you know, ancient Europe, uh, the, the merchant vessels that transported goods and services and commodities and product to make money were called revenue cutters. Okay, it's just a term, not too significant. But the whole system is set up about one thing, money. Because the banks um, and the, th the banks through their politicians and legislational system, it, they set up a body of laws to further extract money or set up a system that money is always flowing up. It's being extracted out of your bodies, out of your sweat equity, out of your label, labor. So the whole thing is, is based about one thing, commerce. Okay, Jordan said in the ship, um, you know, when a ship is pulled into a dock, it's docked. And we go back to what happens when a, a ship pulls into a dock. It has to present a manifest, you know, a certificate of manifest. It's really simple. It's all about forms. Everyone ever see uh, that movie Brazil? <laughs> okay. That's pretty much the system we're operating in today, if you get, take a closer look at it. So you have a certificate of manifest. And it just describes all the property that's on the ship. Ship sits in its berth, as Jordan mentioned earlier. There you go. The mother, and, and this, the system that we operate, if you understand admiralty, it's a very esoteric system because the, the banking has been operating longer than 6,000 years, probably longer than uh, recorded history, longer than the Code of Hammurabi, etc. But the mother, the mother is a vessel, or all of us are vessels because and this is a philosophic esoteric point, but our bodies are a warehouse and you live within the confines of your skin if you take the concept that you're a spiritual being. Okay, so it's an energy vessel. So the mother is a vessel delivering a, um, a product, swimming down the rivers of the, mer uh, the birth canal, and uh, you know, it's delivered to the dock or the dock door. And what is it? It's delivery of a human resource because that's all we're considered, humans. We're human resources. And, you know, you get a birth certificate to, to vouch for that. It used to be that, you know, if, if a child was born in a common law society, you know, collective society, you know, they were recorded in the Bible or some sort of, you know, official records, etc. But everything is about certi certifications or a B stroke six like in Brazil, you know. So... Um, Certificate of live birth, and we're talking about money. You're a human resource. So what is money? It's energy. That's all it is. The, the system is set up that it's the control and flow of energy from generally the bottom up, the basis of the foundation of the people up into the hands of the bankers that further perpetuate and dictate more laws to further ext extract money. And we'll demonstrate this in just a moment. So battery... Um, is uh, pretty much what we're considered. If anyone has seen uh, The Matrix, you know, our bodies or our vessel, it, it, it's where we store the energy. We eat food, its energy is transmuted from the sun, goes up the food chain if you study biology, and it's, you know, the energy is stored in our fat cells. Well, take another, um, take a look at this. A nursery in essence, if we're talking to the world of Admiralty and the ship pulling into the dock and getting the port, uh, coming into port and we're getting all this paperwork and it's all about money, the nursery is an energy farm or a monetary farm. It's a production house, kind of like the Matrix, you know. So we're going to go into um, some definitions from the Law Dictionary what these terms mean. Jordan says we need to take take a look at words because we're uh, word-controlled people, right? And I'm obviously I'm not making any of this up. If you look in Ballantine's Law Dictionary, a human being is a monster. So that's what, you know, when you walk into court, this is how they're looking at you. So you want to get your constitutional rights, you know, you want uh, your liberties, not your freedom, but you want civil liberties, well, they're working with this guy. How does that apply to you? So let's take a look at what monster says. A monster is a human being by birth, but in some part resembling a lower animal. A monster hath no inherent blood and cannot be the heir to any land, albeit it be brought forth in marriage. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Are we talking about a human being, which is 
in the law of admiralty or the law of banking, we're talking about a let's pretend game. Limited liability, no one taking responsibility for their actions. Um, that's why we live in a corporate fascist system where everyone wants to incorporate and not take responsibility for what's going on. And this guy over here, the real you that's aware and functions in, in like a state of common law where it takes personal responsibility for everything he does and uh, you know, will make, make his wrongs right and everything. This guy, it's, it's on a piece of paper only. That's the certificate of live birth. That's the, the B stroke six. That's the let's pretend game. So if the, the construct that is law has two kinds of people. You know, in, in fact, the spiritual being is in it. You won't find a spiritual being in a law dictionary. But you'll find the definition of a person. But peculiar enough, the definition of a person, they try to get you caught up with a natural person. But how do you define a word with its own word? Isn't that, That's a peculiarity in itself. So person includes a natural person, a firm, a co-partnership, or an association, or a limited liability company or corporation. The entire essence of the let's pretend game is to get you to be one of these things, a corporation functioning in, in a state of fascism, in a limited liability uh, world, a let's pretend game, where no one takes responsibility for their actions. So we get into the construct of what the physical world versus the legal world is. You have the world of land, which they try to superimpose this matrix body over, of the world of admiralty. Um, in the Constitution, which is predicated upon common law, we deal in the world of uh, gold and silver. What happened to that, guys? You know, now we're dealing with Federal Reserve notes, which a note, by definition, is evidence of a debt. And anyone heard of national debt? Yeah. Or how about income tax? You know, all income tax does is go to pay national debt. It doesn't pay the streets. It goes to pay the national debt with the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve came into act in 1913. And, and that, that's a whole story in itself. And the taxes that are generated as, as a result of using Federal Reserve notes, uh, who collects that? The IRS. When were they started? The same year as the Federal Reserve, 1913. But guess where the, uh, the, the IRS is based out of, guys? Puerto Rico. It's not even an agency of the United States government. You know, it's a, that's a whole story in itself. So we have consciousness over here in the physical realm, but the legal realm, it's completely devoid of consciousness. We have present or represented. You ever hear the term in court, you're represented, or you're get, you need an attorney to represent you? Because we're playing in the let's pretend game over here. And when you're dealing in the world of the physical, you have lawful. In the legal realm, in the world of statutes and codes, we have legal. And again, real versus fiction, substance versus reflection. We have the real thing, the real essence of substance, or we have the thing named. And we also have the creditor, or we have a debtor, a lender or a borrower, object versus symbol, a physical body, or a paper certificate, such as a birth certificate. So in essence, who you really are considered to be legally is a fiction a concept or idea expressed as a name, a symbol that, that legally has no consciousness. It is a juristic person, it's in legis. It's a, it's a word written on a piece of paper. It's not you. You see, when we're dealing in real law, when there was a controversy between people in society, um, in, in like a tribe or a community, if there was a problem, it was, you know, someone would come up to the elders in society and they would bring you before a committee and they would, they would hash it out before a committee of like the Sanhedrin. If you take it back several thousand years in, in the Judaic cultures, they would take you before the Sanhedrin. And you'd have to give your testimony before the Sanhedrin. Each party testifies, right? So if you look at the word testify, it comes from the word testicle because you have to hold the males, which were the ones that functioned in commerce, the women were excluded from that. They hold on to their testicles, and if someone's caught lying, what they were holding was what they would lose. That was one of the penalties. I'm not kidding. So otherwise, it's social and political ostracism, or they can't function in commerce. They become basically a person, you know, persona non grata. They don't exist. They don't function in that society. They need to move to a new location. So if we're dealing in the world of reality, 
in the world of uh, spirituality, uh, you know, minus the, the particular religious construct, you know, you have, the concept is you're having uh, a union between a man and a woman, typically, and you're having a union before your creator, before your, uh, based on your belief system. And that's all the unification you need, whether it be for, before a, a priest or a rabbi or um, what have you. It is your particular contract, your covenant with the person that you love. But now we, step, we take a step forward into the world of the statute system or the codified system. We have the let's pretend game. We need to get a marriage license. You have to ask for permission to do something you would normally do based on your own accord and before your creator force or, or your particular religious or um, philosophical belief system, whatever that allowed for. But now we need to ask for permission from the man if you can have this relationship. Why? Because the whole system at large is predicated on commerce. It's now been boiled down to a business relationship. And if, if you don't think so, I've heard Jordan say this a million times, the first person that you're not going to see is, is the Lord. You're going to see the attorney. Okay? And you're going to talk about who's getting what, and it becomes a matter of contract. So you have to get an application license to marry. So this is what we're operating in over here. We have a three-party marriage. Instead of just you and uh, you know, uh, your wife, I guess it could be a four-party marriage if you're still incorporating the, the spiritual dynamic of your creator force. But now you have your wife and your husband and the state. And, uh, and if it's an application for a benefit or permission, that permission could be revoked or denied. And then you get into this, uh, the construct of jurisdiction. The state, if they gave you anything, they can come in and take it away or tell you what to do and how, how to do it. And then you're, you basically have to live and operate under the codes that are prescribed that dominate the, uh, the application for the birth certificate, etc. So such things as application for, <laughs> for the permission to travel freely you got to get a driver's license. License, in essence, if you follow it, it's, it's predicated on a system of business. Okay? I just thought that would be funny. <laughs> yeah, and the name is all caps, and we'll get into that stuff a little bit later. Uh, license uh, is certificate uh, or the document itself which gives permission, authority or liberty given to or uh, forbear for any act. So what we're talking about here. Is anyone heard of just getting up on their own free will and accord and going somewhere because they just cared to do it? Or maybe it's a necessity you need to go somewhere to get food and survive. You have an inherent system of rights that are bestowed upon you by the Creator that are predicated on natural law principles. What goes up must come down, etc. But again, the world of admiralty or the guys that are considered or interested particularly in one thing, how to extract the wealth and power from the energy sources, which are the batteries that are you. Because all money in society nowadays is generated a result of your potential and what you put into the system. Because Federal Reserve notes, they have no value whatsoever. They're backed entirely on the full faith and credit of the U.S. population. You know, so without, without you backing these things up, they have no value at all. So in order for you to use these, uh, this money in society, you have to get up and work every day and put something into the system. And what you reap, you'll sow. So the system cannot perpetuate itself without you. So what is the vehicle that is the courthouse? Well, the courthouse is a very fascinating thing. It's, it's a primary facility that I like to call them chop shops, meat grinders, or wood chippers. But um, these, uh, these entities or institutions or systems are the primary uh, method or modality or one of the primary me methods or modalities by which your sweat equity ex is extracted out of you on a consistent basis. Uh, we take it from the ground up as something petty as parking tickets. Uh, although parking tickets aren't particularly handled in court, they can be, and we'll talk about how you, how you do that later. But, you know, parking tickets or traffic tickets and... Traffic tickets and parking tickets are the number one generators of indirect taxation or revenue in the state of California, period. If you look at the numbers, you will be appalled. So check this out. You have a courthouse, Masonic Lodge. Looks kind of similar, right? 
Courthouse, Masonic Lodge. You have a courthouse. And you have a Masonic Lodge. I'm just leading you somewhere. Okay, you have a judge, you know, the Honorable Smiley. And you have his gavel, right? What is this? A Masonic gavel. So what I'm trying to say, and I'm not going to get into a big uh, Masonic presentation here. I'm just setting you up or to inspire you all to do a little investigation as to what the system that we're operating under today is founded upon. Who were the founders? Who were the founding fathers really? Were they a great bunch of guys as, as we were told in uh, our history classes? Or was there a greater plan? Was there a grand dynamic, the great work? What were they aiming to achieve? And if you do a little investigation, you'll find out that it's about one thing, business. So Judge, uh, Jordan mentioned earlier judge rules from the bench, okay? This is the basic derivative, uh, bench in Latin, bank, and bank. And the judge is a banker. And he, and if you look at the whole legal system, how it works today, it's based on banking entirely. Now, river directs the flow of currency. We're talking again the world of admiralty. It's about, you know, money is often referred to as currency. And again, the court system is always after our currency. The courts are set up to regulate the flow of currency and the, uh, the entire court system as it operates today is a let's pretend game. And we'll take a look at this. The let's pretend game. Why is it that you have to file, you ever heard the term motion in court? You have to file a motion in court. Why? Because the thing doesn't exist unless you say it does. It's basically your paper soldier in the let's pretend game you're yelling out, you're calling out to the judge, I'm filing a motion because you're not, you're not dealing in the world of substance where you're communicating with parties openly and uh, you know, stating the facts. Okay, I was injured on or about this day and this is how I was damaged and these are my witnesses. Now, based on the evidence I'm presenting, that guy should lose his testicles. You know, what do you think about that? And, and uh, <laughs> and the other guy presents his evidence and says, well, that guy should lose his. So, and then the, the committee of the Sanhedrin or your, your judge or whatever your elected official that's uh, directed to give the rule a law or balance the, uh, the books, um, he makes the determination accordingly based on the evidence that's presented. And, but now we have, a we have a system of judges in our corrupt system that typically make up the laws that go along because they have a vested interest and the outcome of every court case. And I'm going to show you guys some things that's going to get the wheels turning for you. So you guys ever heard the term uh, circuit court? Circuit court? You know, circuit courts, energy, battery, money, banking, electricity, gross national product. You know, it's all about energy. What happens, though, when you interrupt the flow of energy or the currency flow? You break the circuit, right? Or... You get charged, okay? You get charged. <laughs> that guy's wearing a black robe like a judge, by the way. <laughs> so anyways, okay, but when you go to court, or, or when you go to court, you're charged with counts one, two, and three. And the judge is a bank, but if you look at the, uh, the etymology, the, the concept or the term counts one, two, and three are actually accounts, why? because the judge sits on the bench and he's a banker. It's all about the extraction of your sweat equity and we're proceeding forward to why. Okay, what happens when you hire an attorney to represent you? Uh, Mr. Scheister here. You know, again, why do you need to get an attorney? Because the whole thing is a let's pretend, pretend game because the attorney, uh, if you look and take an analysis of it, we're dealing with attorneys, not counselors in law, not lawyers particularly. We're dealing with an attorney that's there to represent the certificate or piece of paper, the artificial person or the natural person that cannot stand and speak for himself properly or the presumption is so unless you rebut it. So he's representing the artificial legal fiction, the reflection, the thing named the debtor or the borrower because why? We're dealing in banking. 
You're there, most of the, the court cases are, or um, lawsuits are of and pertaining to money, are they not? Why else do you go to court? You know, all crimes are commercial. If you look at the legislation and the codes, everything boils down to a dollar value. And in fact, I have, uh, not with me today, I have a case, the, um, the president of Tyco, he, he was uh, convicted in court and he, added, he was awarded, or the sentence was like a $25 million fine or, or the, the, the end result was like $25 million fine or some, something like that. If he didn't pay it, he was going to jail for life. What do you do? He whipped out a check, cut it, paid it to the court, and all the game was over. He didn't go spend one day in jail because it's based on bookkeeping entries, the entire thing. So if you got enough money, as, as most of you have an inherent understanding, if you got enough money, you're not going to jail because you can get lots of attorneys to represent that piece of paper to make a deal with the judge or to properly represent you, such as OJ, and get off. Okay, so when you hire an attorney, um, an attorney, um, let's take a look here. An attorney occupies uh, a dual position which implies a dual obligation, okay? Uh, his first duty is to the courts and next to his client. So his, as an officer of the court, in any circumstance, he yields to whatever the judge's direction is or his obligation to the Bar Association. Now, the Bar Association in itself is a whole other construct. Um, you know, you have local Bar Association, uh, multiple constructs. You have local city, county, state, etc. But if you go to a website, it's called ordotemple.org, you'll find out that all Bar Associations hail from the, the Temple Bar, which is directed at the ends of court, that has a direct affiliation to the Ordo Templar Militaris, which is a Knights Templar organization. And that contract, that covenant to direct all bar associations on the planet is issued through what's called a letters patent. And you guys can look up that term later, but it's a contract that's set up based on the Knights Templar. Who are those guys? Those guys are the guys that founded what's known today as our modern banking system. So um, in any regard, uh, with respect to the court, um, if, you're call, if you hire an attorney, you're called a ward of the court. You ever hear that? As an operation of law, if you hire an attorney, you're considered a ward of the court. But if you look up the definition of ward of the court, it's infants or persons of unsound mind. So how many of you guys hired an attorney and said, geez, what an idiot I was. Get this guy. So if your um, if your attorney was an officer of the court and his first duty was the judge and he's given him the secret handshake or the little sign, a little lapel pen shake, whatever the deal was with the judge uh, based on his payout or whatever the situation may have been, if you're convicted as a result of his lack of performance or conspiracy, you're going to be uh, you're going to prison or jail where you'd be placed in a cell, okay? A cell. A cell. But however, again, remember the concept that the the whole the whole court system, our whole monetary system, is based on ancient esoteric principles. Your body's energy. It's it's a vessel. Your body's a vessel. You have blood vessels, etc. And you're traveling on the seas of commerce. Not really, because we're, we're on land, but they superimpose the world of admiralty on us. And anyone can verify this because the Navy has surveyed all the land in the continental United States. And there's brass cap high watermarks in all the local towns and counties. So they, they've, in a let's pretend game, they said we're underwater right now. That's why they have jurisdiction of admiralty. And it's unless you rebut that presumption of jurisdiction or the admiralty realm, it shall reign supreme. But if you, it, you might have the opportunity to pay bail. You ever heard paying bail? Okay, you might have the opportunity to pay bail if you've been placed in jail. Okay, bail. Okay, bail or bail. To bail someone out is to provide cash and get them out of prison or more generally to help them out of a difficult situation. Well, I think going to court, period, it can be a difficult situation, especially nowadays. Especially a financial one, and we'll just go on from here. But after you pay bail, the court has concluded its sale. 
It's sail on the high seas of commerce. You see where the etymology is going? It's just we're dealing in Admiralty, ancient Phoenician commercial law, as Jordan said. Um, but everything you said and done, uh, when, when everything's said and done in, in court, and you've you know discharged all your debts, you've paid your debt to society. How many of you heard that? Because everything is commerce. Period. The, one of the first definitions of commerce is the the exchange of ideas, concepts, philosophies, interaction, goods and services, etc. And then the, one of the other definitions of commerce is sexual relations. And I'm not kidding. So the byproduct of that is a commercial product where, again, you get the paper certificate and you play the let's pretend game. So ultimately, which is it? Are we talking business here? Or are we talking justice? And as Jordan would say, it's nothing personal. It's just business, like the mob says. So now to the, we're going to get or progress further to a solution-oriented situation over here because most people, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out that the system is not based on natural principles. It's not based on a win-win situation, that there's harmony in the universe and everyone goes home and they, they have enough uh, money in their pocket, etc. But where does all the money go? Marvin Breyer, and that's a man that found out. Marvin Breyer is an ex, um, I don't want to say Bank of America employee, but he worked for one of their subsidiaries and he's a cobalt programmer. And he's the guy that designed the foundational computer systems or the, the, the code that transfers all, all money and, and et cetera and balances the books at the end of each day. Well, Marvin, unfortunately, had a very uh, rough situation where his daughter, um, her children or her child was about to be stolen from the Department of uh, Social Services or one of those particular agencies. And Bar Marvin could not stand the pain to see his, that happen to his daughter because his daughter in his life is everything to him. There's not, she's the capstone on his life's pyramid. Anything and everything for his daughter. So what Marvin did is he did a little homework. He tracked the money that, that was being uh, raised from the court and where all the, all the funds and all the money that he was paying into the court system for fines or uh, just court docket filings all going into slush funds, guys, without exception. Uh, Marvin, by the way, um, has been in Insight Magazine about six times. He's been in the LA Times. If you just tarp, type in Marvin Breyer on the internet, you'll see tons and tons of articles on him. And he's a, a personal associate of mine, and, and I've been fortunate enough to get in, in with him to understand how he does what he does, how to crack the matrix, how to break... Uh, break through and understand how to get to w these guys where it hurts, the money. So if you track the, the funds that are paid to the court, without exception, um, at least we haven't found one. And, and certainly we wouldn't be arrogant enough to say that it's uh, not entirely possible that it might go to the, w the proper directory where the funds are supposed to be appropriated. But the funds are, are going into different accounts as opposed to uh, where they're mandated by legislature. Instead, they go into private accounts associated with the judges' association. Um, however, it's really interesting about what the judges' associations are. And, and you can look at any court system in America, namely, uh, we like to uh, particularly look at Los Angeles because uh, a lot of us are originally from there and done a lot of investigation over there. But the judges' association, if you um, talk to them, try to find out who they are, they're allegedly a tax-exempt organization. However, they're not registered at all with the IRS, period. They, they fall under a 508 category. And uh, I'm not a super huge tax guru, so I'm not going to get into the codifications. However, the IRS turns a complete blind eye to the fact that they haven't properly registered, but they're amount, amassing tons of these funds. Okay, so but you'll find out why you go to tax court or you go to court based on willful failure to file or you're not paying your fair share, etc. Why you bring in proper proper legal arguments or issues as a matter of law and they throw you into the wood chipper. Why? Because they're all working in harmony together in concert. Okay, so the judges association. What do these guys do? They raise bonds. They create debt without taxpayer approval, okay? 
And I'll explain to you guys how, how this information was found out. Primarily, paying checks, Marvin never uses cash or credit card to pay for anything at the courthouse. He always uses a check. And once, once a check is negotiated or processed, it, on the back of the check, it has all the routing numbers, okay? The routing numbers and, and usually a phone number, so you can call and find out who it is. Otherwise, you can use something called the Public Records Act. I don't care what state you're in, everyone has a Public Records Act. And in some cases, if you're dealing on a federal level, you can do it under Freedom of Information. Now, under Public Records Act requests, um, in California and Hawaii and other states, I'm, I'm sure it's acro across the board, it's the same. If they fail to answer, it's a $1,000 fine. So it's, um, it's all about how you put it on a piece of paper. But the law is created for your benefit in the event, at least we would like to think, it's created for our benefit, that there is a particular check and balance, but they, they tuck it away or they hide it away in codes. Well, what are codes? By definition, they're something that's used to hide something. The military uses codes all the time to hide their communications, etc. So the money that is paid to the Judges Association is used to pay off anonymous bonds. Okay? The anonymous bonds are issued through Merrill Lynch and other associations, but Merrill Lynch is the primary bad guy. And, and we have paperwork that, that demonstrates this. Marvin got uh, a judge thrown in jail and some prosecuting attorneys, and there's more on the way. Because, you know, you ever heard of judicial immunity? Well, guess what? You don't sue the judge, you sue his association. Or you, you find the evidence of the wrongdoing um, through Public Records Act requests, or you trace the money on the check, and then you, do, you present the data to the grand jury, and they got to investigate it. And then they got a problem. So as a result, Credit Suisse and Bank of America are the primary underwriters on those bonds. And uh, the a company by the name of DTC, it's called De uh, Department or Deposit uh, Department of Trust Corporation, controls the bonds. But guess what? DTC is ran by the Federal Reserve Board members. Okay? If you take a look at who's, who's on the payroll, it's all a complex matrix using, f and they want, and how do they want you to pay? You're not using gold or silver to pay at the courts. So I've tried to pay them. They don't take the stuff. I've tried to use all kinds of stuff at the courts, guys. And, but they want that Federal Reserve note product, a private product that's, you know, set up under a sham situation, 1913, set up the same time as the IRS, 1913. And there's some other agencies, which I won't mention, that were set up in 1913, too, which is a little, Kooky. I'll tell you later. So, I like to call these things Anani bonds. The interest on the Anani bonds is paid through the court fees, fines and restitution, and along with forfeitures. So, when you get convicted, you know, in a traffic ticket matter, not only do you pay, you know, let's say it's $100, usually there's a statutory limit on, the, on traffic tickets, but what do they do to create more revenue? They give you what's called a penalty assessment. Of and not last time I checked that I was in court was 170% uh, penalty assessment. So you pay an additional 170% on the top of the $500 fine for traveling down the right down the highway um, you know, or on the high seas as they would call it, uh, etc. So the credit rating of the anonymous bonds that are issued by Merrill Lynch in association with Bank of America and Depository Trust Corporation in association with the Federal Reserve, who is in association with the IRS, based out of Puerto Rico, is, um, is all based, the credit rating's performance is based on, or determined by the courts, uh, or the, the banking business, ability to arrest, prosecute, and convict, or in, with respect to uh, civil matters, litigate. So what we have here, is a perpetual meat grinder that's feeding off itself. It's, it's infinite because it, it's a system, a system that is endlessly perpetuating itself. And the more you use Federal Reserve notes, the more there's national debt, the more money that needs to be paid to the IRS. But let's take a further look at what the bonds are for. The bonds, the finance payment to contractors for the building of more courthouses. Okay, so what I'm saying is it's perpetual. They all they do more than courthouses, but that's the principal amount. Uh, 
Well, they're all, you know, they're probably all in, in concert. Not even probably. I mean, the buildings look the same even. So, uh, but they also build uh, things as post offices. Now, interestingly, in the city of Van Nuys, the Van Nuys courthouse, Marvin Breyer found out that the courthouse, the entire courthouse, was bought for five dollars by a judge. And Marvin, by the way, has disqualified basically the entire bench. There's no judge that can't hear Marvin's case because what he does is he uses Public Records Act requests, um, FOIA, and he also um, um, goes down to the local library and pulls the judge's statement of economic interests. You know, once a judge becomes a judge, they have to give their entire profile where their money is going, and they might have some stuff offshore and et cetera that you might not be able to find. But for the most part, the way he creams these guys is he finds out, okay, how, who's, who's this guy ruled on? He'll pull their whole case history, how many, how many uh, cases he's ruled on, and he'll see, well, he ruled on uh, you know, a case dealing with McDonald's, and he owns stock in McDonald's. So he reverses entire court cases or kicks ju judges off because there's a conflict of interest. So it's all based on money, conflict of interest. And he also finds out through Freedom of Information, or namely uh, Public Records Act, um, in one instance he found out the judge had a brain tumor. And, uh, but he's still making all these decisions off the bench. He walks right into court, especially when he's powered up about their conflicts of interest or he's tracked the check. He, what he does is he just he'll buy like one page of the docket, you know, costs a dollar. The next day he'll go back and buy another page of the docket. And what'll happen is none of the the checks that he's using to reflect pages of the docket being bought are not showing up when he has all the invoices reflecting that he's purchased the stuff. So and then he tracks the money, finds out that it's it's going to the judges association, etc., and he generates more conflicts of interest. And what Marvin will do is he'll go into someone else's court case, say your court case was litigated on like six months ago and you already got the book thrown at you. He'll go in and buy a page of your docket and track where the money goes and finds out that it went to the judges association and he'll file a, cross, a complaint against the judge and he can get your whole case reversed based on conflict of interest. The judge is going to jail and your case is reversed non pro tonque, <laughs> as if it never happened. So. But, but the principle that, the, the reason why I'm, I'm trying to present this information, because these guys have inherent weaknesses. And our system, and I believe in the, the concept of law as agreement between the parties based on natural law principles. You know, whether you look at the Bible or any particular belief system, there's common natural law principles that if most people never violated, we never have a particular problem. So, um, in any regards, you hit them where it hurts, and it's the money. Because anytime these guys are fooling with money, they have a bad habit. And it's usually as a result of their mi misappropriation of funds. And you guys want proof? Here's a sample of the couple, couple of checks that were cut from the Judges Association. Uh, this one is you know, only, only 7160, but we have others that you know, range from several thousands. And, uh, but it doesn't take... Well, 571. But we have some that are got a couple extra zeros on there. But the, the whole point is, all it takes is one cent to be misappropriated for the guy to go to jail. Yeah. My, uh, my stepmother used to work for a judge in a courthouse. And they couldn't even make a photocopy of something for anything other than what was, was required for their particular office. Otherwise, it was considered a misappropriation of funds and it, it was a felony. So one cent is all you need. So um, this is a, um, an example of Mar Marvin's uh, slush funds. Uh, you know, if you guys do a Google search, you'll find endless articles about uh, Marvin and what he's been able to do. Um, this is the end of the basic uh, essence of uh, my presentation, but, um, but I'm going to talk to you guys more in detail about um, how to do Public Records Act requests. But in relation to the PowerPoint, as in the words of Jordan Maxwell, you better go back and do your homework.